Welcome again to our online Bible study from Pine Valley Church of Christ as we are finishing up today our look at the Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonica. And then we will continue on next week with his second letter and how it complements the first very well. Uh, but in this first letter, he's really been emphasizing to them uh, his worry for them, his love for them, uh, because of the situation in which he was run out of town, uh, because of some of the Jews who became very jealous of the response that he was getting to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Timothy now has come back with a report uh, that all is uh, going well there. And he wants to continue to instruct them and help them in any way that he can. In fact, he reminds them in back in chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 10, you are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless you were, we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And that has been sort of the theme through the rest of his letter, is as this encouraging father comforting, urging to live lives worthy of God who calls you to his kingdom and his glory. And he has discussed what that kind of life is, uh, specifically the first part of chapter four, and that they are to be sanctified and to avoid sexual immorality, to control their bodies rather than their bodies control them, uh, continue building on their brotherly love for, and, uh, for each other and to in their ambition to lead a quiet life, mind your own business and work with your hands uh, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you may not be dependent on anyone. And then, as we saw last week, he gets into answering some of their concerns and questions about the second coming of Jesus and how that, uh, that some of the Christians who have now died in this very short period of time, are they going to be missing out on something uh, they just don't understand uh, what hope do those who are dead in Christ have versus those who are alive in Christ. And he has assured them uh, that they have the exact same hope. In fact, those who are dead in Christ will be raised up first. And then those of us who are alive will be called up into the air with them. And we all go to home, an eternal home with Jesus in heaven together. And it's a beautiful picture, but he's also reminded them, we we don't know the time. And in fact, in we saw in Matthew 24 uh, that Jesus tells his disciples that only the Father knows. He does not even know when he is coming back. So our job is to be ready. And beginning in verse 12 of chapter 5, he starts sh sharing some concluding remarks, which are, again, very much like a a father sharing advice with his children. Let me get our screen share going here. And he says, there's some things here I just want you to uh, remember and focus on and stay focused on uh, in your new life in Jesus Christ. Uh, so, uh, first part, beginning in verse 12 down through uh, verse 22, uh, are just a series of things. They all work together uh, in things he wants them as their spiritual father uh, to make sure that they focus on so that, uh, as he said before, they live lives worthy of God, their heavenly father. So now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always tries to be kind to one another and to everyone else. 
Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And do not quench the Spirit's fire or put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good and avoid every kind of evil. He begins with something that he considers uh, very important, that they give respect and uh, give high regard to those who uh, work hard among you. And there's a lot of debate whether this section is talking about uh, elders or deacons or uh, some don't think that there would have been that much of uh, development and maturity in the Thessalonian church by this time, which is only six or eight months after Paul has been there. Uh, but we do know uh, from Acts 14 that at the end of his first missionary journey, he went back through all the places they had been and they appointed elders in every congregation. And we might think, well, how could they do that in such a short period of time? And remember, a lot of those early converts were Jews who had grown up going to synagogue, who learned scripture. They had a spiritual maturity about them already. Uh, we know from Acts 17, when he's in Thessalonica, that it's not only some Jews who were converted, but many God-fearing Greeks. In other words, these were people who had, in essence, already become believers in the one true God of Israel, uh, possibly had been worshiping with them at the synagogue and had come to know uh, the scriptures that they had, which was the Old Testament. And he may have, we are not told at any point in uh, Acts or in either of these letters that elders or deacons or anyone else has been appointed in this leadership role. But there are already those who are more mature and those who are working hard. And I think he leaves it uh, more generic here because remember he's he's addressing the entire congregation he's not just uh, trying to single out and give instruction to those who are working hard he's instructing those who are being led by those who are working hard and he mentions a couple of things and it could be that they are elders uh, those who uh, are over you uh in the Lord is the second phrase. Uh, it could also be translated who care for you, who oversee you. And there's a lot of connections there with the work of elders uh, within a church. And those who teach and in, or admonish you. Uh, I think a better translation there is teach because they're the ones who are helping everyone else mature. They're doing the things uh, they are working hard amongst you, and we all know uh, that this is important that congregations have uh, mature individuals, and we want, need to listen to those more mature men. We give them the respect and highest regard, uh, appointing some to be elders, some to be deacons, some to be preachers and teachers, you know, all the things that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 4. You know, that God raises people up into these positions so that uh, the body as a whole can mature and grow together. And it's the same core things that he's talking about here. Uh, but he goes on from here. Uh, well, first, let me say this. Uh, Paul understands, and we know that only uh, men are to be selected to be elders, uh, but we also know that there are lots of mature women uh, who we should respect and put in high regard as well. Now, many of us grew up uh, listening to and being taught by uh, mature women, and we held them in great respect and high regard uh, because the effort they put into teaching us scripture. We still have uh, we have other men in our congregations who work hard. They may not, because of uh, some situation in their life, 
uh, never be appointed as an elder or a deacon, but they still work hard and you should respect those individuals as well. And there's this connection then uh, that is given uh, as we says, you know, hold them in highest regard and love because of their work. And it's the whole group that fits this description. And he goes on to remind them now that they all need to be part of this work and have a responsibility to this. This would not be if there were already elders appointed in Thessalonica. It's not just their job to do it. Uh, it's not just the evangelist job or anybody. It is the work of the group. And that's what he is addressing here. Because he goes on to say, not only he shows respect to those who work hard, but live in peace with each other. And you, brothers, verse 14, you, brethren, brothers and sisters, here are the responsibilities all of you have. Not just these uh, individual leaders uh, or a, a group of elders that may be selected, but everyone. He says, you're to live in peace with each other. You are to warn uh, those who are idle. In other words, those who are not working hard. And he's going to expand on his discussion of this because it apparently becomes quite a problem in Thessalonica. Uh, and we'll see that in his second letter. Uh, encourage the timid. Uh, don't let anyone uh, not do things because they fear their own inabilities. Remind them that this is the work of God and he will work through you. Uh, help the weak. Uh, be patient with everyone. And go on and make sure you don't pay back wrong for wrong, but be kind to each other and everyone else. In other words, we're not going to respond uh, to others in the way in which the world does. And all this can be is to be done in love. So living in peace with each other is not something that is passive. It's not just something that is um, lacking any kind of conflict. Uh, to warn someone, even in love, uh, puts a relationship in some co conflict with each other, uh, to encourage, uh, to help, to be patient and kind. All of these are things that are active and that we have to involve ourselves in on a regular basis. And consequently, helps us as we focus on loving one another as Christ has loved us. Uh, we don't react in the way in which the world does in seeking revenge, but rather uh, we are kind to everybody. We're kind to each other and to, in the Greek says, and to everyone or to all people. This is to be the characteristic that the world is to see in us is this kindness, this love. This goes back to that earlier description in chapter four of the quiet life. And we work hard and we show who we are to people uh, so that we were respect, re, uh, we win the respect of outsiders. And he wants them to continue to focus on these things uh, as they go fo forward. And Paul likes to group things together. You know, that first section, uh, be at peace with one another, urge, warn, encourage, help, be patient. Uh, and kind, uh, all sort of work together now, the next couple of verses, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now he understands, and he's already mentioned it, that he that they are being persecuted, uh, even by their own fellow Jews, uh, many who would be, probably be family members, and there's not a joyful situation. But because of the life we have in Christ, we can still be joyful despite what we go through. Uh, we can pray continually about dealing with these situations and we can give thanks, not for the situation, but we can give thanks to God for him being there with us. 
and for what he has done for us in Jesus Christ and filling us with his Holy Spirit to help us deal with whatever goes on in this life. So that is the attitude in which we come and deal with anything. It is one of joy, uh, one in which comes to God in prayer and opens ourselves up to him and can give thanks in all circumstances because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This all works together closely with uh, the next couple of verses. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. Hold on to what's good. That which you understand and know is from the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. Uh, the word he uses there is one that was used for putting out fires with water. Um, and he, he doesn't want them, uh, to stop the spirit's work in their life or treat prophecy. When you understand true prophecy, uh, which is a revealing of God's word, uh, to people don't treat that with contempt, but test everything. Uh, John tells us in first John chapter four, verse one, to test the spirits. And make sure that they are spirits from God uh, that proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, that he came and uh, lived in the flesh and suffered death, burial, and resurrection in the flesh. Uh, he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, to fan his into flame the gift. You know, here this is the opposite of what he's talking about here. Don't, don't say, oh, no, I don't want to, you know, even though it may be God's will for us, it may be God's instruction. Uh, but anytime we say no to that, we're quenching the spirit. He says, but understand what is good and hold on to that. And which naturally leads to avoid all kinds of evil uh, that we keep that away from us so that we make sure that we're having a good influence uh, we're maturing in our life and our responsibilities to each other, uh, that we are following the example of the more mature and our church leaders, uh, such as elders, as they show us the way, uh, as they lead us. And as he often does, Paul then uh, gets to a point where he he has already reminded us, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, so that you may live the life worthy of God, as he mentioned earlier. Uh, all of this pointing toward, as he told them in chapter 3, verse 10, night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. And besides a couple of, you know, some of the basic doctrinal uh, teachings that he's given them about uh, staying away from sexual immorality, focus on your brotherly love, uh, living to you know be ready for the coming of Christ, living a faithful life uh, for however long it is. You know, these are the things that he sees uh, that these early Christians feel are extremely important. And he doesn't get off into a lot of the stuff uh, that uh, we spend a lot of time on today, which... Uh, tend to be much more uh, things of opinion and how we should do this or shouldn't do this. Uh, that's not the way we've always done it before. Uh, all of these kinds of things that can distract us. He helps us see here uh, with these early Christians uh, who are very young in their faith in Jesus. Here's the stuff you focus on and stay focused on. And that's where it leads then to his final prayer. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. And I charge you to before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Remember, this is God's work. 
This is God who brings you peace. This is God who sanctifies you. Uh, this is God who will keep you blameless until the end. But we have to respond to it. We have to let it work in us. And he reminds them in this of may God, praying to God that he, the God of peace, who has made peace between us and him through the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, keep our soul blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he has emphasized to them that is going to happen. Uh, it is a hope that the dead in Christ have as well as those who are alive in Christ. And it's something that is sure because the one who is faithful, he is coming. He will do it. He uh, fulfilled everything he said he was going to do in his earthly ministry. And it reminds us of that time when he ascended back into heaven and his disciples are standing there and he's told them uh, what's about to happen. Uh, the angel looks at him and says, why are you looking up? You, you've got work to do. We have a message to share with the rest of the world. And he will come back just as he ascended, he will descend. And uh, this is something he picks up on and gives them even more detail about in the second letter which we'll be looking at in the weeks to come. Jesus is faithful. God is faithful. He has always kept his promises. And he has promised Jesus is coming back, and he will. Our job is to be ready uh, to allow God to sanctify us, make us holy, uh, to keep us blameless through the blood of Jesus as we live faithfully, following in his footsteps as we are led by the Holy Spirit. And finally, as he often does, he says, don't forget about me. Pray for me. Uh, he is dealing with a lot of things that are going on uh, in his missionary journeys. Uh, he has faced a lot of opposition. He is going to face even more in threats to his life. But he says, keep me in your prayers. But so that I can fulfill my ministry and remain faithful to the end because Jesus is coming. He is faithful. God will keep his promise. And that keeps us focused on the things that are most important. Living a life worthy of God. One that is sanctified, that stays away from sexual immorality. It stays away from the evil of the world. It seeks to be an influence on the world living a quiet, loving, caring life uh, that is kind to one another and to everyone around us. We show the world Jesus as we can then share with them the message of his good news, that he has come in the flesh, that he has been crucified and buried in the flesh, that his body and spirit and soul were all raised from the dead and now sit at the right hand of God. And he's coming back for those of us who are ready, who are faithful. And we will all join him in that eternal home forever together. It's a wonderful hope and grace that we have in Jesus Christ. We'll pick up next week in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. As he returns to talking about uh, when things are going to happen, and we have to come to an understanding that it's about God's timing. It's not about when we want things to happen. It is God fulfilling things in his own time, in his own will and purpose. And so we'll be picking up there and hope that you will join us then. So between now and then, may God bless you and keep you healthy and safe 